Hello, everyone. Um, can I just say it's a great pleasure to be here. And at the same time, it is also rather daunting for me to be surrounded by you know, literary translators and writers and critics, especially John, who is, who is my teacher. Um, I was just recently rereading the Analects of Confucius, translated by the great Belgium-Australian sinologist, essayist, and writer Pierre Rickman and Simon Leys, or Simon Leys. I think his name needs to be mentioned when we're talking about the Australian engagement with China. And, and in the Analects, you don't see any of Confucius students voicing out their views in front of their master. Um, <laughs> Instead, they just ask questions. So I think this is what I will do today. I wish to take this opportunity and to put forward a few questions on the subject of translating poetry, which is something that I feel very passionate about. But first, I thought I should just share with you something that I came across recently, a translation of a 7th century Chinese poem by the late 19th century poet, writer, and some would call an Orientalist. As Brian mentioned this morning, um, this term Orientalist has uh, come to mean different things uh, in recent times, uh, Judith Gautier. For those of you who are, who are not familiar with Judith Gautier, here's a, here are two photos of her, one of her as a, her as a young woman and another photo taken later in her life with, with a cat. Um, Judith Gautier is the daughter of the French poet Théophile Gautier. At the age of just 22, she published an anthology of Chinese poetry entitled The Book of Jade which became an instant success, not just in France, but also in Europe and beyond. Writing on the influence of French poetry on the American scene, the poet and translator Kenneth Rexroth described Gautier's little anthology, and I quote, uh, as a precious minor classics of French letters where the general public gained their first intimation of Chinese poetry. But for some reason, Rexworth thought Gautier's Chinese teacher and collaborator uh, was someone from Thailand. But in fact, he was a very a highly educated political refugee by the name of Ding Dunling from the north in Shanxi province. So in this wonderful anthology, uh, you will find seven short pieces attributed to a certain Tan Ro Su, on further investigation, this poet turned out to be the Tang Dynasty poet, Zhang Ruoxu. But the trouble is, only two of Zhang's poems were ever recorded in the complete works of Tang poets, which was actually compiled and published by the great -grandf by the grandfather of Cao Shiqing, the author of Hong Long Long. Um, so it is likely that Gautier made some of her stuff up or got hit Zhang Ruoxu mixed up with someone else. But nevertheless, um, at least four of these poems were certainly excerpts from Zhang's best known poem um, entitled Chun Jiang Hua Yue Ye, which literally means spring, river, flower, moon, and night. The title itself already poses an enormous challenge for the translator, the syntactic ambiguity of the Chinese language, which was also brought up in this morning's session, um, means that a word can be used as a noun, a verb, or an adjective according to the context of the reader's own interpretation. These five characters offer almost an infinitive combination of readings. A Chinese translator called his translation a moonlit night on the spring river. The British sinologist Charles Budd called his the river by night in spring. The American sinologist David Lattimore just called his translation spring, comma, river, comma, moon, flower, comma, moon, comma, night, giving an equal treatment to the five motifs of the poem. And other possible titles include Blossoms on the Spring Moonlit Night, or A Spring Night with Moon and Flowers. Um, J Judith Gautier simply placed her translation under the section of her anthology entitled Le Lune, The Moon, using the moon as an overarching theme. And from these titles, you can see that she included three out of the five motifs, the moon, the river, and the flower. Night is indeed implied, but there's no mentioning of spring. 
because I don't have time to go uh, to go over the poem, I was only given seven minutes. Um, so I can only give you a summary of the poem, which is ra ra I think is a, a crime in itself. Uh, but but here it is. So the author Zhang Ruoxu begins by describing the rising tides of a spring river expanding and reaching towards the distant sea. And in the distance, arising with the water's motion, is a bright moon. So bright is that the, so bright is the moon that the flower looks as if they were covered in frost, and the white sand of the islet became <coughs> imperceptible. And then, standing next to the river and gazing at the moon, the poet puts forward this great cosmological questions. And here I give you a literal translation of it. Jiang Pan He Ren Chu Jian Yue. On these river banks, what people first saw the moon? Jiang Yue He Nian Chu Zhao Ren. River moon, what year first shine on man? Life of man, Ren Shen, Dai Dai, generation after generation, perished, Wu Chong Yi. Jiang Yue Nian Nian Zhi Xiang Si. River moon, year by year, unchanged. And here's Gautier's translation. I'll read you the English version because I, I don't speak French. It is translated by James Whittle, called uh, The Tranquil River. Men may look at the moon all their lives. It crosses the sky as the tranquil river follows its course, never faltering or lingering behind, but men's thoughts are ephemeral and wandering. I think although in her translation, Judith Gautier completely ignored all the previous depictions of the moon, the river, and the flowers, she is really able to capture the juxtaposition between the ephemeral nature of human lives and human thoughts, which is something she added. It wasn't in the original Chinese, which is even more transitory. And to put that in contrast with the eternalness of the moon and the river, Okay, going back to the poem itself, the author then leaps out of this philosophical mode of thinking and turns his, his, his attention to those beneath the moon. From a traveler on a raft thinking of home to a lady sitting in her bedroom chamber thinking of her loved ones. And this is where Judith Cotier really took most liberty in her translation. Here are the two lines from the original, which simply reads, Shining on the lonely one, the, the makeup mirror stands. Jade door inside the blinds, twists but does not go. And that's just the Chinese. And she called her translation, before her mirror. Sitting before her mirror, she gazes at the floor, where the bamboo curtain breaks the moonlight into a thousand bits of jade. Instead of combing her hair, she raises the curtain. And in the room, it is as though a woman, robbed in white silk, had let fall her mantle. I mean, what a wonderful translation. Uh, the bamboo curtain breaking the moonlight into a thousand pieces of jade. That thousand bits of jade. Where did she get that from? The original just says jade door, yu hu, for God's sake. Um, <laughs> um, but I think people nowadays ceases to read these sort of early transmissions of Chinese poetry because they're outrageously free. And many would call this a loose adaptation rather than a translation. But here are my questions. Um, Maybe for work of art to be, be part of literature, a translation should cease to be read as a translation. Um, my second question also concerns the, the, trans, the, the ability for a poem to be translated, quoting Robert, For, Robert Ford's famous statement, poetry is, what, is which is lost in translation. But I give you something that which Ezra Pound wrote once, which I find very touching. Um, he says, I resolved that I would know the dynamic content from the shell, that I would know what was accounted poetry everywhere, what part of poetry is, is, was indestructible, what part could not be lost in translation. And I think I'll leave you with that. Thank you very much.